So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elisha. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? So Elijah left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant. This is the word of the Lord. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Maria. And good evening, everyone. Uh, let me add my welcome to, uh, well, who, there's been Tim and Phil and Joe already, so let me add my welcome. It's a big team effort uh, tonight. My name's Matt. Um, I'm part of the, the sort of help run the youth and the kids stuff at St. Andrew's here. And what a joy, hey? What a joy it's been to see these eight guys come and confess their faith in Jesus and get baptized. It's been amazing. Um, I almost didn't really need to say much, do I? What a witness, what a witness that is to Jesus and the work he's done in their lives. But I'm going to anyway, so just have to bear with me. Let's pray. Come on, let's pray as we start. Father in heaven, we thank you again um, for the Lord Jesus. We thank you again for the way that he's broken into these eight lives that we've seen tonight. And he's died for them and he's called them and he's saved them. And we thank you for their response. And we pray now for the rest of us too. Please would you help us understand a little more about you. Please, Lord, as we leave tonight, we'd be amazed by what you've done for us just a bit more. And show us afresh what it means for us to follow you, we ask. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I want you to do some imagining with me. Can you, can you imagine where you would be just in the middle of a normal working day? Pick a day, Tuesday, Wednesday, whatever it would be. Where would you be? Try and picture yourself. Where would you be in the middle of one of those days? Would you be maybe in meetings? Or would you be teaching? We've got a lot of teachers here at St. Andrews. Would you be looking after little ones? Maybe you'd be fixing something or building something. Maybe if you're a student, you'd just be getting out of bed at midday. <laughs> oh, no, I'm just messing. Maybe you'd be at a lecture uh, or you're in lessons, where might you be? Just in the middle. Just picture, are you there with me in your mind? Picture with me where you are. Now have a think about this. What could make you drop absolutely everything and leave, never to come back? Halfway through an important meeting, what would make you drop the pen, leave the room, and not look back? Halfway through an exam, put the pen down and just walk out the hall. What might make you do that? Could anything make you do that? Stop everything you're doing, leave, and never look back. Now, whatever it is, it would have to be something pretty significant. I bet we can all agree on that. Something pretty major would have to happen for you to just walk away from whatever you're doing, not to look back. But I wonder if you noticed, that's basically what happened to a young man called Elisha in our reading a minute ago when Maria read it so well for us. And it's just a little bit weird, isn't it? Let's just say it. it's just a little bit strange. It is odd. As Tim said, we've been following God's prophet Elijah over the last couple of months. And he walks past a young man called Elisha who's just plowing his fields. And he silently just puts his cloak onto Elisha's shoulders and walks off. And Elisha chases him, chases him down to the end of the field and says, I'm coming, I am coming, I just need to say goodbye to mum and dad. And then he goes home and they have a barbecue and then he leaves. That's just a bit weird, isn't it? It is a bit weird, but something clearly significant has happened to Elisha that he's done that. And you might be thinking, what on earth has this got to do with me? What on earth has this got to do with baptism? What on earth has this got to do with anything? Well, bear with me. Because hopefully with God's help over the next few minutes, it won't seem so strange. Here's, here it is for Elisha in a nutshell, ready? He hears God's powerful call and he responds. Those are the two things we're going to see. Elisha, hear God's powerful call and he responds. And he responds by saying goodbye to his old ways and starting a new way of life. See, remarkably, even though 1 Kings was written some 3,000 years ago, it's massively relevant for us tonight as we celebrate these baptisms. 
as we've already heard, God has called each of these people that got baptized tonight, hey, come and follow me. They've heard his call and they've responded. An old life has been put away and a new life in Christ has been started. So let's just tuck in, shall we? God's powerful call, that's what we're looking at first. And I wonder what you thought when I asked you that question. Midday, what's going to make you just drop everything? I've seen that advert where they like find the lottery ticket in their pocket. Would it be that? Oh, I've suddenly got millions. Oh, great, I don't need this anymore. I'll head off. Would it be that? Would it be money or fame or promise of long life or success or fulfillment? What would it be for you to just drop everything and go? <clears throat> maybe nothing. Maybe you'd say, well, I'd never do that. Let's have a look at what it was for Elisha. It was none of those things. It was God's powerful call to Elisha that made him drop everything and go. And, you know, if you look just above where we are, so look in your Bibles, look just above verse 19 to verse 16, and you'll see that it is God that tells Elisha to go and call Elisha. It's a real shame their names are so similar. I'm going to get it wrong, but Elijah is told by God to go and call Elisha. Go and tell Elisha to be the next prophet. And that's exactly what Elijah is doing in our passage. Here it is on the screen again, if you haven't got the Bible in front of you. Let me read it. So Elijah went from there, that is, speaking with the Lord, and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Elijah went up to him, threw his cloak around him, Elijah is extending God's powerful call to Elisha. Now, it is a bit strange, right? I get that. He, he's got a cloak, and he puts it on him. Or, or the, another word for the cloak is a mantle. So he takes his mantle, and he puts it on Elisha's shoulder. It's, where, it's a symbolic thing. It's where the phrase passing the mantle comes from. Elijah's saying, look, Elisha, God has called you. One day you will wear this cloak as God's prophet, it's a symbol to Elisha of God's powerful call. And we might have just missed it, but Elisha didn't, did he? Have a look down at verse 20. No words were needed. And Elisha goes running. Elisha then left his oxen, ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said. Then I'll come with you. See, God's powerful call has changed everything for Elisha. It's totally changed it all for him. And you see, what is true of Elisha here is true of every single Christian in history, including those getting baptized tonight. God has stepped into our lives and called each of us to be his, to follow him. Isn't that an astonishing thought? Elijah didn't decide who was going to follow him as the next prophet. Elisha didn't wake up that morning and go, I'm fed up with plowing fields. I think I'm going to be God's next prophet. And we don't come up with the idea of following God. God himself takes the initiative. He is the one that moves towards us. And thank goodness, because the Bible is very, very clear that if it was left down to us, none of us would be interested in God in the slightest. Have a look at these pretty unflattering words from a book in the Bible called Romans. Let me just read them for you. There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away and have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. They're pretty bleak words, aren't they? About what humans are like left to themselves. Left to ourselves, far from wanting to follow the one who made us and gives us life. We turn away from him. And we do life on our own without a second thought for him. It's what the Bible calls sin, and, and look, sin is serious. It's not to be joked with or taken lightly. But the mistake lots of people make is thinking that because of our sin, because of the way we've treated God, because of what we've done, well, that means God is no longer interested in us. And if you're going to remember anything tonight, remember this. That could not be further from the truth. God isn't just after people that are good, whatever that might mean. Despite what we're like, despite our sin and how we've treated God, he wants us and he calls us to follow him. Now, look, as a church, we've been reading this book here, 
over Lent, gentle and lowly. And he puts this beautifully in so many ways. What's the guy's name? Dane. He puts it really beautifully in so many ways. But this, I think, is one of my favourites. He says this, Christ, or that is Jesus, extends his heart to sinners. I mean, that's pretty beautiful in itself, isn't it? Christ extends his heart to sinners like you and me. Not only in the posture and possibility of open-handed, outstretched arms as I'm ready for you, but more emphatically with open-hearted pursuit. What a thought that through Jesus' love, he pursues sinners. He comes after us. And it gets even better. He doesn't just pursue us like he called Elisha by sending a prophet to chuck a cloak around him. He sent his own son, Jesus, to pursue us. From the comfort and riches and glories of heaven, Jesus came down to earth for sinners like you and like me. It's amazing. Look, he, these words just put it so well. We had this at youth group on Friday. Let me read it. Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus, God, he became a man. In fact, he became a servant. In fact, he took on death. In fact, he took on death on a cross. Why? So he might deal with your sin and my sin. So he might deal with our rejection of God. He came from the riches of heaven to the hell of a cross in pursuit of you and me. That is astonishing. Did you know that that's what God is like? Did you know that that's the God you're missing out on if you don't know Jesus? Do you need to remember that? That's what God is like tonight. He's not distant and cold towards sinners, towards you, towards me. But actually he's active and he's loving and he takes the initiative moving towards us at the ultimate cost to himself. See, Elisha, he was just plowing a field, minding his own business, not expecting his life to change forever that day. But God had a very different plan. And, and maybe you're here tonight, sort of just minding your own business. You've come to cheer a friend on or cheer a family member on. Maybe you've come not expecting your life to change forever. But I wonder if God's got a different plan for you. Maybe you are here tonight so that you can hear his powerful call that says, I want you. I died for you. Come and follow me. Maybe he's tapping you on the shoulder this evening. Or maybe he's just reminding you. Maybe you've been a Christian for a week or for 40 years or anything in between. Maybe the Lord's reminding you of his call this evening. As Christians, we never need to wonder whether God loves me. We never need to doubt how God feels about me or you, especially when we mess up. It's not like we twisted his arm to get in in the first place, hanging on by our fingertips. He pursued us. He loves us. He died for us. He calls you to follow him, and he doesn't make mistakes. What a comfort, what an encouragement that is as we seek to live for him in our lives. God's powerful call, well, it changes everything. Well, how do we respond? That's the next thing we're going to think about. A bit short, a bit quicker, I promise. How are we to respond? Again, look, we're going to first look at Elisha and see what, how he responds and then see what that means for us. So heads back down, verse 20 and 21. Or oh, sorry, up at the screen if you haven't got a Bible in front of you. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? So Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people, and they ate. 
Then he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant. Again, it's just a little bit weird, isn't it? Elisha and Elijah, their interaction is just a bit strange again. Elisha says, let me go and say goodbye, then I'm going to come with you. And I'm still not a million percent sure what Elijah means when he says, go back. What have I done to you? It, it, maybe it could be two or three things. It could be, go back, what have I done to you? Like, I've got no control over you. What have I done to you? I'm not your boss. Do what you want. It might be that. Who knows? Maybe he's like, oh, go back. What have I done to you? You're the wrong guy. You're not committed. You're going back to your parents. But I think more likely with what happens next, he's saying, go back, go and say goodbye, but remember what I've done to you. God has called you to be his prophet. Eyes on the prize, as it were, Elisha. Don't forget who you are now. You're not some farm boy anymore. You're going to be God's new prophet. Don't forget that. Again, it looks like Elijah gets it. He heads home. This is pretty amazing. He heads home. He gathers his people around, maybe friends and family and colleagues. He makes a big barbecue by burning all his plowing equipment. And then he cooks up a storm with some oxen. I bet it was a cracking party. The smell would have been amazing. The food would have been delicious. And they celebrate. Really visually in front of them, the end of his old way of life and the start of his new beginning. For Elisha, God's powerful call, well, it literally meant leaving comfort and family and wealth and friendship to become God's prophet. And for some today, God's call might mean literally leaving those things. If you're called to be a missionary somewhere and travel abroad to share the good news of Jesus, if you're called to run a church or to some special world, it, it, God's call might mean leaving things literally behind and moving forward with a new life. And actually, we've got some in church who had to leave their family and country because being a Christian, Jesus calling them and then responding meant that their life was then in danger. So they had to leave to follow him. But for most of us, God's powerful call, it won't literally mean leaving. But at the very least, Jesus' call to follow him means everything else in life becomes secondary to him. Everything else in life becomes secondary to Jesus. Let's just have a look at what Jesus said to his disciples in the crowd once. He said this, If anyone would come after me, if anyone would follow me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Those that follow Jesus are called to deny, we're called to deny ourselves. As we start to follow Jesus, we're called to say no to what we want and our desires, and yes to what Jesus wants and his desires. It's a bit like this. Look up on, up on the screen. I, I hope this is helpful. Um, look, here we go. This is, this is my life. It's like in the shape of England. Look, if my life was a country, there you go, that's what it looks like. And look, my life is filled with all the things that make up my life. So, oh no, sorry, we call it Matopia. I forgot that, because it's my life, right? So it's called Matopia. And here are all the things that fill up Matopia, okay? I really love sport and uh, my work and my thoughts, that fills up my life and talk, talking and feelings and love and money, family. And I choose, right? Obviously, who chooses what I do at Matopia? Well, Matt chooses, okay? So I, I sit in London, here we go, or the London of Matopia, and I sit on the throne and I call all the shots. Right? Of course, it's my life, I call all the shots, it's up to me. But when you become a Christian, you start to see that really you're not fit to run your own life. That's what I've seen in my life when I was younger. I'm not fit to run my own. I make all sorts of errors and mistakes. Things go wrong. I hurt myself. I hurt other people. I am not fit to run my life. I get it wrong all the time. And as we saw earlier, when we run our own lives, God is nowhere in the picture. It's a disaster. But becoming a Christian is to see that there is somebody who can run your life much, much better. <laughs> and he came and he loves you and he calls you and he's died for you. So becoming a Christian is to get off the throne and to say, Jesus, I need you to sit on the throne of my life. I need you to run my life. Not what I want anymore, but what you want. And it makes sense, right? When the God of the universe moves towards you, 
when he dies for you, when he loves you, when he calls you, of course he knows how your life should run. He created you. He created relationships and feelings and money and love. Of course he knows how my life works best. So you put him on the throne. Jesus, I need you to show me what life looks like now. And I can say, since that's happened, I'm a better sportsman. I'm a better dad. I'm a better son. I do my money is much better than before. Much, much better than before. How I spend my time. We've got to put Jesus on the throne. Let him lead our lives for us. That is what it means to become a Christian. So look, are there there things that you're not giving over to Jesus? Are there things you're holding on to still trying to run? What do you need to say, Jesus, I shouldn't be in control of this anymore. What should I do with this? You won't regret putting Jesus on the throne of your life. I know I certainly haven't for the last 16 or so years. See, when... (laughs) God calls. This is God's powerful call. It changes everything. He moves towards us. He loves us. He died for us so that he could call you into a relationship with him. How do we respond? We say, oh, old life away. Jesus, show me how to live for you now. You be on the throne of my life. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for that reminder that you take the initiative with us, that you move towards us, that you love us, that you sent your son to die for us and call us into relationship with you. Please would we be marveled by that again this evening and please help us to respond rightly, to say no to our old ways and yes to life with you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.